phones off. Kia ora koutou and welcome to uh, this session on, uh, session on pitching to the international market sponsored by, kindly by the New Zealand Film Commission. My name's Tui Rukyu and I'm sitting here with uh, producer Timothy White. Um, if you haven't read the blurb in the, in the little booklet, I'll just read it out for you. So whether you're looking for finance, distribution or a sales agent, the international marketplace is constantly evolving and current trends are radically different from a few short years ago. Over the next 75 minutes, Tim will draw on his extensive experience at markets around the globe, including his most recent visit to Cannes, uh, and uh, update us on the current appetite and the new players. Uh, for those of you who don't know Tim, or perhaps haven't heard um, all of his very extensive bio, I'm just going to cover off on it now. Um, Tim's probably one of our most experienced uh, producers. He's a graduate of uh, Canterbury School of Fine Arts. He's got an incredible list of credits, and we're going to go across them just so you get an idea of the breadth of the projects that he's worked upon. Um, Nadia Tassa's Malcolm, which um, won uh, AFI Best Film in 1986. Spotswood, starring Anthony Hopkins and Russell Crowe. Cossie, starring Tony Collette and Rachel Griffiths. Michael Reimer's Angel Baby. Uh, Death in Brunswick with Sam Neill, Vincent Ward's Map of the Human Heart, and Gillian Armstrong's Oscar and Lucinda, starring Ralph Fiennes and Kate Blanchett. Tim's executive produced Gregor Jordan's Two Hands, starring Heath Ledger and Brian Brown, uh, before heading up uh, working title uh, films Australian Arm. And under that banner, he executive produced Ned Kelly with uh, Heath Ledger, Jeffrey Rush, Orlando Bloom, and Naomi Watts. He also produced uh, Getting Square, starring Sam Worthington and David Wenham. Uh, in New Zealand, um, in 2005, Tim produced uh, Two of Phrases Number Two, um, together with Philip Campbell up there. Um, and this was followed by Robert Sarkey's uh, Out of the Blue with Stephen O'Mar, who's also with us, um, which won the best film uh, at the 2008 New Zealand Film Awards, and Warrior's Way with Kate Bosworth, Danny Houston, and Geoffrey Rush. In 2009, Tim produced Scott Hicks' The Boys Are Back, starring Clive Owen. He then executive produced Julia Lee's Sleeping Beauty, which premiered in competition at Cannes in 2011. Um, most recently, uh, Tim was executive producer of The Most Fun You Can Have Dying and produced Robert Sarkis' comedy Two Little Boys, and, um, The Most uh, Fun You Can Have Dying, with uh, Alex Colbaker, who's also sitting here with us. He's currently serving as executive producer on Mr. Pip, as many of you will have heard if you attended the sessions with Robin, and directed by Andrew Adamson, and starring Hugh Laurie. One of the things uh, Tim is doing is very active with uh, first-time directors and also more increasingly with first-time producers. Um, some of the things that he's doing are The Riders, which is a, oh, sorry, uh, an Irish language project with Gabriel Bur um, Byrne and Brendan Gleeson attached, which is with a first-time Irish director, and that's a, an Irish language project. Um, James Robertson's debut feature, uh, which Tom Hearn's producing, and will be announced shortly. Um, Son, of a, Son of a Gun, which is uh, an Australian project with Khan Award-winning director Julius Avery. And Tim's also involved in uh, Lee Talahotti's The Patriarch with Robin Scholes, um, and which is based on Whitty Humida's uh, novel, uh, Bully Busher and uh, The Riders, which is a Tim Winton adaptation of, um, and with Robert Connolly directing. So you can see we've got a very, very experienced um, producer and executive producer to tell us uh, about what's happening in the world today. So what we thought we might do firstly is, can, can, we, can all of the producers in the room just put up their hands, please? Quite a few, that's good. How many of you attended um, Robin Scholz's um, presentation, so there's a little bit of a crossover, but we're going to try and avoid that. How many of you take, have taken a film to market? Okay, that's great. So, um, we, Tim and I have had quite a discussion about the content of, of today's session. Um, we're going to really run it as a bit of a stream of consciousness and give me something to do occasionally by prompting him if he sort of wanders too far in the wrong direction or... Um, uh, we aren't touching all of the points that we wanted to touch on. So the first thing that we um, thought might be useful for, for everybody is uh, for Tim to just really give us an overview of the market as he currently sees it. 
Okay, well thanks and welcome. I hope my voice holds out. Yesterday morning I was struggling to even get it working. Um, managed to get a, a mighty fine sore throat and now a head cold. So um, I'll struggle through this as best I can. I have some notes to even prompt myself. Anyway, um, uh, I did CAN this year, which is one of, um, I guess, eight or nine trips I've done over the years to CAN. Um, done many of the other markets, but CAN tends to be the premier event. Um, and it was a, a really uh, good um, overview in terms of the sort of health um, and um, direction of the industry. Um, I did something like 55 meetings in eight days, absolutely killed myself. Um, went to very few parties, which was a rare thing. Um, and um, saw no films, which is usual for me. Um, and I would say that, you know, there's definitely a more upbeat feeling. There are a number of new players in the market. Um, when I refer to players, these are principally sales agents in the business of acquiring new product. Um, and their job is to on-sell that product. So they are, you know, absolutely on the lookout for um, projects that, um, in their eyes, are commercial enough to um, you know, keep their business ticking over. Some of those uh, are very large and established and will go for generally uh, more prestigious product. Um, some are much smaller and are much more niche orientated. I'll go through a sort of list and actually I think Tui will explain later. I will do a bit of a summation that I'll give to script and screen so they can hand out to people if they want, so don't get bothered about trying to take notes of these companies I mentioned. But um, for those of you with good retention, um, it um, might be useful. Uh, amongst the new companies at the moment, you've got Altitude, um, which has been run by Mike Runnagall, um, who's ex um, Pathé International. He's sold things like Bright Star and Iron Lady, and um, considered to be one of the um, better sales agents um, and um, I think he had a flirtation at one stage with um, Mr Pitt in fact. So Altitude are one of the key new players. Um, you've got Embankment which is Tim Haslam and Hugo Grumbar who are ex um, uh, Hanway. You've got The Solution, Lisa Wilson who is ex um, or still actually working for GK Films which is Graham King. He's an just to explain, Graham King is a, um, a former head of Fox International who's one of the more successful producer financiers at the moment. He started off doing things like um, the remake of um, an Internal Affairs. Um, that's what it was called, wasn't it? The um, Oscar winning film, The Departed, that's what it became. Um, and um, d done things like Hugo, worked a lot with Martin Scorsese, um, and also produced The Town, um, Ben Affleck's film. So anyway, uh, Lisa Wilson's running this company, Solution. There's Mr. Smith that David Garrett has set up, who is ex-Summit. David Garrett's a New Zealander, um, who actually is a good point of contact for um, some of you in the room if you've got a project of profile, he tends to be dealing with bigger stuff. Um, he's just signed an output deal with DreamWorks um, to sell their foreign stuff. Um, you've got exclusive media, Guy East, who's a big uh, veteran but relatively new company. Um, others like Protagonist have been around for a while and that sort of sits within a group of the, some of the established sales agents like Focus International, run by um, Alison Thompson, who's absolutely the classiest sales agent out there. Um, Alison is selling uh, Mr. Pitt for those who sat in or didn't on that session. Um, you've got other big ones like Film Nation, E1, K5, um, who tend to be chasing um, cast-driven material, classy stuff. You've got um, the genre-driven companies like I Am Global, Voltage, Sierra, QED, um, 
So depending if you've got a genre orientated project, you're going to be approaching companies like that. Most of them tend to be American based. Um, the, um, you've got some great European sales companies, um, Wild Bunch, Celluloid Dreams, uh, Memento Films are another great one, um, and Studio 37. Some of these are financing sort of companies too, like Studio 37. Orange is um, the backer of that. Um, so you've got some of those sort of telecommunications companies that you know, have massive pools of um, capital. So um, a Studio 37 <coughs> is definitely an interesting prospect for people looking for a company that um, can both fund and, and sell something. I'll just explain, if I dive around, you just have to go with me um, as much as you can. Um, there is a huge difference between sales companies who are prepared to offer um, uh, advances, uh, those that rely on gap funders, various, and I'll go on to talk about the gap funders out there, who um, essentially lend against their estimates. Um, and they have quite strong interrelationships with some of those gap funders. Um, some of these sales companies actually also work as production entities too, um, especially when they've got that ability to fund things. Um, you've got smaller companies that often will be the ones that you'd be more likely going to, um, you know, to approach with um, more modestly budgeted drama. Um, Independence, a British company, The Salt Company, um, Films Boutique, Visit Films. Um, then you've got, within um, the can market, you've got the bigger distributors who tend to be multi-territory purchasers, who will look at material, um, but mainly to track. Um, they, they are, and there are not many of them now. Um, it's Fox Searchlight are the key one. The Weinstein Company would be second. You've got Focus itself. Focus International is the sales arm, but kind of quite unrelated to the um, distribution arm. You've got Sony Pictures Classics, um, and you've got the French company Studio Canal, um, who along with the company I mentioned earlier, E1, they have multi-territory distribution arrangements. So they, base, they sell as sales agents, but they also buy on a multi-territory um, deal. While Bunch itself is a little bit the same, but Studio Canal has just bought Hoyt's, in, Hoyt's distribution in Australia. So they're very keen. They've seen E1, which is a Canadian company with strong French connections. They've seen them... E1 bought Hopscotch um, about a year or so ago for 22 million Oz, I think. Um, and um, this purchase came through a couple of weeks ago with Studio Canal, which is exciting for all of us because um, they're much more likely to be a, a viable um, alternative for local production and one that is strongly interlinked with um, Studio Canal. Um, to not harp on about them, but Studio Canal co-fund a lot of the working title product. They tend to fully fund some of the edgier working title projects like um, State of Play, Tinker Tailor. I think um, Studio Canal fully funded them because Universal, who own working title, didn't feel that um, those were necessarily you know, um, friendly enough to American audiences. So um, the French company gets itself quite involved on that financing side. Also at can you have, and all the other bigger markets, you have financiers and packages. Um, some of these have come out of um, uh, the agencies. Some sit within the agencies. There, um, at can this year, there was Cassian Alwes, who is ex-William Morris. Um, he... Uh, EP'd or produced three films in competition this year, hugely active. He ripped something like 12 different equity funders in the US. So you go to someone like a Cassian and he essentially just takes you over. Um, 
So it's quite um, intimidating, you know, if he really likes your sort of thing. And I was in a situation where I went, well, maybe not. You know, I'll try and get it going um, in other ways because I kind of felt I had alternatives on one particular project. I'll talk about that. Um, you've got um, Rich Klubeck and Rena Ronson. Um, those who sat in on Robin's financing thing would have heard uh, of Ron. Uh, Rena Ronson mentioned, um, who's one of the two financing packages at UTA. Um, they are Andrew Adamson's agent, um, and they will. They're in the business of setting up their clients' projects, so they get themselves pretty involved um, with projects that might be out there that might be represented by producers like me. Um, but they see themselves as having a role in, you know, ensuring that the film gets up. There are complications with them because they generally want to go on to sell North America and will try and squeeze in and take a fee for packaging the project, which is normally, you know, between 5 and 10%. Um, now, they, these financiers, um, as in the go-between sort of people, um, they, as I say, go to the various equity funds that are out there, um, and there are some production companies that are hugely cash roll, roll, you know, Participant is one of them that, again, Mr. Pitt got close with. Um, that tends to be a, um, you know, uh, a m much more sort of socially aware company that tends to like to structure its investment around, um, uh, you know, projects or, or stories that seem to be, uh, you know, have a, so a social message. Um, one of their early films was um, North Country, Nikki's film. Um, and other um, companies there, you've got one really active one, um, Megan Allison's company. She. Megan is like the 26-year-old daughter of Larry Allison and has like a massive um, production entity called Anna Perna. Um, <coughs> she also had like three films in competition at Cannes this year. Hugely active. Um, does, seem, does sort of genre stuff. Um, I think she picked up the Terminator franchise um, through to really quite high-end, edgy sort of directors. Um, amongst the projects, and she and um, Cassian had a linkage on some of the projects, uh, or the film screening and competition. Um, they were um, uh, two Antipodeans. Um, Andrew Dominic, Auckland boy, la Auckland born lad who directed Chopper and um, has been living in the States. Um, he did a movie called Lawless um, that both Megan and Cassie Always were involved with. And um, also John Hillcoat, who's Australian and Canadian. Um, he had a picture there. Uh, Olympus Pictures is another one of those companies. They made things like Rabbit Hole. They tend to fund quite low budget material. They ca came in on um, Mr. Pip through uh, through the UTA connection. Um, and Olympus Pictures have about 10 million a year. They will do about four projects, most of them quite low budget. And um, this is when it gets tough, you know, in, in your mind when you know you're dealing with someone like a, um, uh, a film like Rabbit Hole with Aaron he Eckhart and Nicole Kidman that was made for $2 million. Um, you've got something like Ben's film that was, um, he was very careful not to mention what it was, but I can tell you it was way less than $2 million with um, William S. Macy and Helen Hunt and um, John Hawkes. We are, you know, we, we face, you know, as Antipodeans, um, you know, incredible challenges when you're looking at independent American cinema that can package with some really great actors and um, tend to make things way cheaper. New Zealand, at least, um, is um, um, a little further down the scale than Australia is. That really struggles under a, um, uh, a system that's, you know, 
become too bureaucratized and too unionized over the over the years, and um, is kind of completely out of step with independent filmmaking in the rest of the world. Um, I digress. Um, uh, now, also in terms of the international landscape. Um, I tend not to um, look at the Australian options at Cannes. Um, it always bemuses me that um, I see Australian um, producers running around Cannes trying to do meetings with Australian distributors. A little bit different for New Zealanders, um, but uh, you know, I, I would be doing my business with them you know, in Sydney or Melbourne, wherever they're from. But um, in terms of those international markets, um, you know, be it something like MIF or a CAN um, for New Zealanders, you're going to be going to companies like um, Hopscotch, uh, which is now e Entertainment One, this Canadian kind of English come French company. Um, you've got Transmission that have an output deal with Paramount and coexist with them, and Transmission bought Mr. Pip. Um, they're involved in the Tom Hearn project um, and um, now Studio Canal that I mentioned was formerly Hoyt's. You've got Rojo that have a big linkage with um, Warner Brothers. Um, and for New Zealand films um, will always be a bit of a tough sell. They don't pick up many local things. They had a big success with Red Dog. Um, I think it was a long, long time ago when Rojo actually distributed a New Zealand film. Um, you've got Madman, um, which is probably the last of the key sort of substantial independent companies in Oz. Um, and then smaller ones like Pinnacle, uh, Becker's, you've got Rialto, of course, New Zealand, Australian company, and um, Sharmal. Um, some of the studios have local arms, like Paramount, if you're not going via transmission, and Fox tend to actually look at local product much more than the other distributors will but you know Universal will take a look at something that seems to have um, you know ingredients that will appeal to them so that's my sort of landscape of who's out there um, and we'll get in the body so we're, of we're our conversation. Just to reassure you we've, uh, you've heard a lot of names out there about players who are relevant at the moment um, we will make these available. Tim's going to do a, a, a short note that he'll put through to script the screen, so you will be able to get that kind of information. So don't worry about it too much if you haven't written it down. So we now know sort of who the players are, but we, really, Tim, we want to find out well, what are they after? What are they looking for? Okay. Well, um, I, I touched on it in my um, rambling thing, I think, yesterday. But um, uh, dramas are really tough sell. Um, you know, you. Partly because of what I've mentioned before, you know, these independent films being made in America and do understand it. At Sundance, you've got um, the selectors there that are, um, have something over 3,000 submissions like, that they look at. Um, and they're doing things like through the word of mouth, um, through the agencies, the casting directors, actors that commit to good scripts. They are tracking something like. It used to be called the surrogate, um, um, now the sessions, the Ben Lewin project. So they are visiting the set of that. Um, you know, some of the A-list festivals uh, will um, tend to re really be tracking the sort of higher profile projects, the filmmakers who are doing things. So there are very few slots that you might find are actually available to the the film that's coming from out of the blue. Um, uh, the, the, the big thing is that drama, you know, will almost entirely rely on names to get the things funded now. Um, and they'll tend to be low budget stuff or if you've got an established director um, who's, you know, got, uh, you know, let's say uh, an appetite for comfort, um, you're going to be doing that at a much higher budget level. Um, and it's weird how with the actors, you know, they will sign on to things for really nominal fees as long as they know no one's getting paid and that everyone is going to get a piece of the action. And, and that at that low budget level it genuinely has prospects of getting 
um, into profit. Um, so you can imagine, with the Ben Lewin project, all of those three actors have a big chunk of ownership. Um, and um, going on, a comedy is also a tough sell um, because it's usually so specific to its local audience. Um, uh, you, you know, uh, I think of a couple of recent huge successes in Australia and New Zealand. Red Dog in Australia um, and Boy in New Zealand, just, you know, phenomenal successes. Red Dog did a 21 and a half million in Oz, and of course you all know Boy did over 9 million here. Um, you can, you know, they were practically, you know, in giveaway show bags, those films, after a while. You, you know, they could not be moved. They, their um, language is, and accents, you know, are a big inhibiting factor, especially with boy, you know, it practically needed to be subtitled um, to the English language market. And these things are not art house. You know, you've got the, the issue with something that may play to a broader local audience that um, to foreign are going to be art house by nature. So, you know, going back to drama or, you know, in, into the realm of comedy, it, it, it's got to be something pretty distinctive, unusual, edgy, daring, whatever it might be. Um, the exception there is, you know, once in a while, um, and I'll go into raving about it, uh, you know, you get these, you know, extraordinary um, stories that are heartfelt, feel good. Um, you know, Ben's film fits into that category, I think, in Australia, New Zealand, you know, Whale Ride is an outstanding example. You've got some of the films of the early to mid-90s in Australia with Strictly Ballroom and Priscilla and Muriel, um, Babe. Um, most recently, the, the Sapphires is something that's, you know, going to do huge business, do probably, you know, 18 million or so in Australia. Um, and, um, you know, it's already sold to a big chunk of the world through a Weinstein Company deal that happened prior to Cannes. Um, just, um, the... What's but making those films stand out? What, what is it about them? That's oh, well, it is that thing that, you know, the feel-good underdog, um, the underdog triumphing. Um, and, um, you know, they've just got a good, generous heart and they deliver to a pretty broad audience. Um, so they, they do absolutely sort of rewrite the rule book. And you do understand whatever I'm saying here is, you know, something never etched in stone. There will always be great examples that break out from that. And um, uh, there's always that opportunity for something that is just exceptionally well written. You know, that quite frankly, you're dealing with people that are well educated, that um, generally can read things that are exceptional. And they read a lot of pretty ordinary material and when they have something that they come across, they will generally want to get involved in it. Um, so in terms of what they're looking at, um, elevated genre is, has been the catch cry for you know, 18 months or so in a few different markets. Um, that is the, the film that is, um, might be a rom-com, more likely to be a thriller, um, could be a horror picture, but... Um, they will be um, films that are well written, are likely to attach cast and um, play to a kind of upscale audience, most likely get invited to an A-list festival. Um, and just to explain the A-list festivals, you've got in this order probably um, um, Cannes, Sundance, Toronto, Berlin, Venice. Um, you've got some other kind of really distinctive festivals like um, Tellur Telluride, South by Southwest, um, one or two European festivals that can be particularly important, especially to their local market. But those are the A-list ones, and those are the ones that sales agents look to have their film um, premiere 
um, which is a great way to essentially launch your movie to um, critics, in the case of places like um, especially um, Toronto, um, all the festivals to some extent, but especially to, uh, Toronto, um, you get to launch it to an audience. So the distributors who are sitting in the audience um, get to experience the film um, with an audience. So it, it's quite an informative thing in Toronto and sometimes particularly important for North America. What, what are some examples, Tim, of an elevated genre film? Well, Drive at Cannes was the most obvious one. Um, he was a Danish director, had made the Pusher series. Um, there was a lot of excitement about him, and he went on to win Best Director, um, and it had uh, attracted um, Ryan Gosling, who everyone wants. You know, he's at the top of everyone's list for the, um, the classy sort of drama, or in this case, you know, he attached himself to uh, a genre piece. And the difference is, that not only do you get to play at an A-list festival, but you um, a, a title like that will still move on DVD. You know, it's a beer and pizza movie. Um, there's enough in it um, to, uh, you know, attract that teenage male audience um, and, and, you know, have like a baseline protection um, that, you know, the, the sales agents know that they, they can move it. Because um, the danger with you know, um, making drama or something like that in a highly competitive world is there's no good just being good. You have to be exceptional. You know, there is no sort of like, there used to be much more you know, various tiers through the market where you could move your thing in tel television, um, free to air televisions under a lot of pressure around the world. Um, there's not the same, um, you know, fallback that distributors had where they had output deals to um, their free-to-air networks. Um, they uh, could, you know, run the risk of buying a film, figuring that, look, I might decide that upon testing it or whatever or after the first weekend I've just mm -hmm. got to yank it and I can sell it to free-to-air and, and make money out of DVD. Um, it doesn't exist quite like that anymore. So um, inside that, that big international market, where does, where does New Zealand fit in there? Um, it um, fits, you know, look, for a, a small nation, there is, um, it does have an incredible profile. I mean, largely through, you know, Peter Jackson, but through an inc a great body of work. Um, and some incredible filmmakers, some highly idiosyncratic, um, filmmakers that in the past have had, you know, creative and, and, and commercial successes. Um, Jane Campion, um, you know, uh, years ago Vincent Ward, you know, had more films in competition. I think he had three films played back to back. Um, you know, he had a sort of track record right up there, you know, with the Lars von Trier uh, of today. Um, and, um, you know, Lee, Lee Tamahori, um, I think m more recently, you know, Whale Rider with Mickey Caro, um, you know, something like that absolutely, you know, has people very consciously looking for, and, and it helps that, you know, that w we've got the neighbour being Australia with something like the Sapphires that comes out. I think um, for the local buyers, um, they will generally be more attracted to indigenous stories. Sorry for the foreign sales agents. You know, the indigenous stories do help set these things apart. No coincidence that out of Australia, some of the, you know, more successful films of late um, internationally, that is, have been, you know, Warwick Thornton's Samson and Delilah, which is much edgier. And, um, you know, the Sapphires is pretty middle of the road. Um, uh, but nonetheless, it helps that it's, you know, given a distinctive flavour. It feels different to what everybody else can generate. If you're making a, uh, a drama about a bunch of people sitting around cafes of Ponsonby, you know, you better make sure you've got Russell Crowe and, um, um, and haul in a few high-profile Australian actors too, um, because you will not move something like that.
Um, now, I, you're probably itching to ask things, but try and save them for later, because yeah. we'll keep my... Um, just just be aware that we're going to uh, have quite a big question and answer um, period at the end of um, the session, so please store up your questions. Um, I, sh I should say, you know, um, link to that, or you might go into the essential ingredients, which I've sort of started rambling about. But yeah, well, I, I mean, it's really, I mean, there's quite a few producers in the room who haven't yet taken um, projects to, to market, so you know, it's a good place for us to sort of cover off on that, about, you know, when, we, when we're going in there with our projects, I mean, um, how should we go about approaching a Cannes or a Berlin or a, or a Sundance? Well, I think I'm quite frankly with anything that starts um, with what you want to develop, you know, what you want to get yourself involved in. Um, you know, you've got to be mindful of, um, uh, you know, what is the audience, you know, locally and internationally for the film. I mean, if you're doing something really low budget and it's a comedy or um, uh, something like that, you know, you've got a whole lot of different sort of questions you're going to be ask asking yourself. Um, if um, you are making a drama, you know, the, the pressure comes on you to have a story that's really distinctive and make sure that that story is extremely well executed, um, as in have a great script. Um, it helps hugely to have a director of note. Um, obviously, you know, I've talked about some of the people of high profile. You could throw in Christine Jeffs, um, you know, Roger Donaldson, Nikki Caro, um, and, you know, I'm leaving out some. Um, darn good filmmakers like Rob Sarkis in that list, but um, I um, think, you know, if you are, um, if you are looking at um, drama, you know, seeing if you've got access to actors, um, we are a little, little bit more liberated, unlike most American independent film producers, um, they will really have a challenge approaching actors um, because the first thing the casting director will ask, which Ben mentioned yesterday, is, um, you know, is the movie funded? You know, I can't go out to agencies and actors with this m as it might be a prospect. Um, occasionally through personal connections or already the profile of a director, you know, actors might have, a, a, you know, relationships and, and commit themselves to projects that are not funded. Um, we are we are little. It is one benefit we do have, and and that is you can you know approach um, a Sydney-based agent for an Australian actor. Um, you're going to need um, the backing of at least the film com in the sense that you might have had the thing funded. You might have a local distributor on board that gives you a sense that the project's got momentum, but you don't necessarily have to be funded. Um, I, um, on the issue of directors, um, there's always an obsession with the new. Um, really hard to go touting a, a second time director whose first film was in the good bracket. Um, you, uh, it's, it's really quite cutthroat. There's, um, if you've had that short film maker who's um, won at one of those A-list festivals or you know amongst the short film, mm -hmm. um, World, um, there are other festivals, um, Clermont and others that are, you know, particularly important for short films and, you know, have a unique status. Um, but still, the big ones tend to be Cannes, Sundance, um, where uh, often those filmmakers have um, already signed up to agents and can help the process of um, getting films funded through those connections anyway. Um, and so, uh, just in terms yeah. of, I mean, uh, a lot of the pitches, particularly um, first-time producers and first-time directors, I mean, they're going to be working with relatively small budgets. Um, yeah. Maybe it's a good time to touch on sort of... Yeah, I'll touch on that. Yeah. One thing, I'll just give it sort of a bit of a reality check in terms, you know, you all are aware of the limited amount of money the NZFC has and they cap their investment at two million and there's pressure to you know spend even less um, because they obviously want you know a critical mass of about four a year um, 
pressure to do some stuff at a lower budget level, though, at the same time, you know, they don't want to be always in the ghetto of, you know, stuff that, um, you know, often will struggle to uh, make an impact internationally. Um, I uh, um, think, you know, I did just on the back of this, um, look at the sort of numbers. If you're um, <coughs> dealing with a film at five million, um, the chances are you're going to be looking to try and get 500,000 out of foreign, um, knowing what sort of numbers you'll get from a local distributor, um, knowing that um, within the SPIF, you know, 40%, your producer offset rebate, within um, the parameters of the NZFC putting in 2 million, and um, the good fortune of having New Zealand on air on board with a local broadcaster who these days seems to be extremely reluctant to buy features at all. Um, I know Robin's had um, real issues with the Patriarch and Tom Hearn absolutely did with a really great script that he's been out packaging. Um, they don't see it as their sort of core business despite the fact that New Zealand On Air seem happy to quarantine a certain amount of their investment and put it into, um, into features. Um, so if you're going higher, like 6 million, suddenly we'll stretch that to maybe 1.1 million. Go to seven and you're suddenly at 1.7 million. You know, the gap starts growing. The higher that budget goes, you can um, see that the, the pressure to deliver out of or, uh, you know, get funds out of foreign just uh, exponentially grows uh, because the, the soft um, equity is capped and your rebate climbs with your spend. Here, uniquely, unlike Australia, it gets capped out at six million. So once you're going beyond 15, um, in the case of Mr. Pip, there was a certain point where our spiff re rebate on that just was maxed out. And the more we spent, uh, we were exposing ourselves to an even bigger gap, in the, which is one of the reasons why there was downward pressure on the budget of Mr. Pitt. We'll just um, keep moving along because we're starting to run out of a bit yeah, of time. To, yeah, sorry. So um, maybe, I mean, let's <coughs> focus on the lower budget. Um, time yeah. Okay. okay, well definitely, I, I've touched on it, they, they've got to be, um, unless you've got that extraordinary gem of a story that is the tale of an underdog, you know, involving animals possibly, <laughs> um, uh, whales or dogs or pigs, as in babe, um, you know, uh, they, uh, you should be treading in the territory of doing material that's highly distinctive. Um, I did a film called Sleeping Beauty that was uh, 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 a barrister turned novelist turned um, screenwriter who'd never been to film school, determined to make a really um, non-compromising, completely uncompromising film. Um, uh, every scene was uh, a one-take set up. The nature of the material was really confronting. Um, she reveled in the notion that a big chunk of the audience would hate it. She loved the idea that, you know, the debate would drive the thing. And um, interestingly, it was the first film that had been accepted into competition um, at Cannes from Australia for about eight years or so. Um, other films that played in other sections. We know from the jurors it came second to Tree of Life to, for the Grand Prix of, I don't think it deserved it, but um, <laughs> it, um, it, because it was distinctive and they saw something as, uh, you know, a, a filmmaker who had some real courage to fly in the face of um, criticism and, and it was a really tough movie to, to finance and convince the bureaucrats were, who were terrified that we were going to be making really nasty pornography, you know, the kind of pornography that um, is, and this involved, you know, full frontal male nudity and old men doing vile things to a comatose young woman. Um, and uh, uh, I don't recommend everyone goes out there. <laughs> <laughs> it was my one set. Um, <laughs> You, I think Snowtown is another example of something, Justin Kurtzell's film, uh, which is pretty uncompromising. I think um, in terms of 
New Zealand films that, you know, maybe it wasn't that edgy, but, you know, sat out there as something, you know, um, unique and, and different as the orator, um, you know, and to be fair, I, I think, you know, maybe the NZFC had, a, had a, um, the comfort of the cultural sort of remit or whatever that allowed themselves to take a risk. But I know that Graham was under a lot of pressure and, you know, a board were somewhat doubtful of a movie... Um, that would be shot not in English, for one thing. Um, and uh, in the case of this Irish film that I'm doing, even the Irish are scared about doing an Irish language film, and, you know, Gaelic, um, because, you know, uh, only a small portion of the, the nation actually speaks it or understands it. Um, and... Let me just... Yeah, we're going to... Yeah. Allow enough time for question and answer. So let's just move on to, um, you know, as a, a first-time producer going into the international market with even with a, <laughs> a, a relatively low-budget film, you're still trying to look for finance. I mean, how do you prepare yourself? What, what's necessary before you put yourself out there? Um, well, I, I definitely think don't go prematurely. Um, I think a lot of people um, feel like they want to go there and experience. It, um, these markets and um, probably feel lost. Um, the truth is you won't get many meetings um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to go as a tourist and just get a smell and a taste of um, something like that because you'll feel a little less um, intimidated. Um, you'll know, you know, how much a taxi will scorch you um, and um, sort out your telecommunications and things like that. Um, all those sort of basic things which are great if you can do that as a bit of a recce um, in terms of especially something like CAN which is probably um, the most in intimidating of all of those. Um, some of these other A-list festivals I've mentioned, you know, aren't really the place for producers unless you've got a film playing there. Um, you know, sales agents will work there, but um, even Toronto itself is kind of hard for a producer necessarily to be that functional. Um, Cannes is, is distinctly a marketplace for producers. Um, conveniently, there's Melbourne, um, which has been doing a great job. There are other markets like Rotterdam, and um, you know, which are quite successful. I, I've, ten, I've never done MIF and I've never done those mm. things, but they are really useful and I know Tom Hearn was there this year and a number of New Zealanders were over at um, uh, MIF. Um, and they do get some good e executives. So um, don't go prematurely. Make sure you're, um, which means make sure you've got a project that's really ready to get out there. There's no point in doing a meeting, getting someone excited, if you then turn around and go, oh, well, it's only at first draft and um, we are about to do another draft or something like that. I don't think that's, because you ne have ne no confidence anyway that that draft is not going to derail. Um, and... Um, if you if you're confident your your script is ready, um, you've you know you've got to know how to pitch it. You've got to know your story. You've got to be able to deliver a pitch in five minutes. Truthfully, inside thirty seconds, someone's tagged whether you're a, a loser or not. Um, you uh, you know, and you you've got to be adept enough to pitch your thing around who's listening. You know. Um, one of the little secrets is try and get your meetings early in, in a market because generally day one, the real heat's not come on, so get there, you know, the couple of days before, get in the time zone. Um, you'll be pretty fried as we all are travelling from this part of the world. Um, and But get your meetings in early because honestly, most of them will try and bump you to the Tuesday after at Cannes um, and by Tuesday they are fried. They have watched, you know, four movies a day, often bits of movies. You know, they walk in and out of these marketplace screenings and watch 10, 20 minutes of a film. Um, they, they're doing meetings, they're getting pitched, like, non-stop. Um, something, and, and, you know, you know their bosses are the ones that are going to be pitched the stuff that's the high-end stuff with actors attached and they've got the packaging agents pitching. So you're dealing with the, um, the kids, you know, 
who are often highly educated, and the truth is, in five years' time, they could be running studios. You know, they, um, so I, I don't mean to diss them. Very often, you know, they, they will read the material way better than their, than their bosses ever will. Um, but, um, yeah, Chip is trying to try and get to them very early in a festival because often they will do meetings knowing that all the big players, especially out of the UK, will rock up on Friday night and they work through Monday and then all the Brits have gone out of Cannes um, and all the big deals have happened in that three to four day period. So if you're getting in early, you're getting them relatively fresh and you might be able to do follow-up meetings or something. If you've got something really exciting once in a while and you've got a script that's ready, they will actually read it. Um, Just to emphasise it, who are you focusing on there? Um, generally, in those cases, you, you're focusing on sales agents. What about the distributors? Distributors, you won't generally get to all those big players. You know, most of the distributors, like the Fox Searchlights and um, Focus and Weinstein Company, they won't buy the sapphires at a script level. They'll go, you know, it's too high risk. We'd much prefer to pay six million than one million. It's, you know, the logic of we get to see it when it's completed, we know what it is, uh, we'd prefer to pay, you know, two, three, four, five, six times what we would pay at script level. Um, uh, n knowing that we've got, you know, something that's really going to make money. Um, and you know, because that's something, yes, it had Chris O'Dowd, but, you know, you had no idea. You know, untried director, um, they're just, it was too high risk. Um, but something like that, they, they also, you know, the, the attachment of a Chris O'Dowd to the Sapphires, um, uh, um, I don't know whether people know of the Sapphires. I'm assuming you do because the director was meant to be here, Wayne Blair. Um, anyway, um, I, I, I think that's sort of a good example of the very thing that you might be pitching. Um, but, uh, you know, you will be tending to do um, meetings with sales agents. There will be some specialist distributors. I mean, if you've got a project that's co-production orientated, that gets a bit different where you can sort of target specific companies in a specific territory. Although, I would say most of the time what you'll be doing there is actually meeting other producers. Um, and it won't be at somewhere like Cannes generally, it'll be, um, uh, you know, at the specialist Rotterdam markets or whatever, um, you know, some really good programs. Bing is involved obviously at a creative level but um, runs various programs. Or, you know, Galway Film Festival has a market Every country often has its specialist sort of markets where they're great for building those sort of relationships where you might feel that the best way to get your film funded is to genuinely um, look for that co-production. And the territories traditionally are uh, Northern Europe, you know, Germany, Scandinavia, the Netherlands, um, and of course the UK. I'd throw Canada into that and Australia into that. Um, uh, l Germany is probably one of the better ones, although it's got harder. Um, just in terms of the sale agents, uh, sales agents, what's the situation with pre-sales now? What's um, your experience? Tough to get them. What they'll do is give you estimates if they really like something, and there are heaps of gap funders out there. Um, uh, I didn't really sort of touch on them, but you've got companies out of Canada, you've got AVA that also cash flows the uh, SPIF, or well, they're doing it in Australia, I'm not sure, Philippa, are they doing it here? AVA? AVA? No. Um, uh, well, they, they fund the producer offset, but they also gap fund, um, based on the estimates foreign sales agents do, based on your, your project. Um, and uh, You've got heaps of British companies like Prescience, Ingenious, um, uh, Quickfire, um, who else? There's... Uh, 
our fulcrum are an Australian company, yeah, but I'm talking about the British, like real gap, hardcore gap funders who will work with a lot of those sales agents I mentioned earlier. They've got very direct relationships with them. So a Tim Haslam at an embankment or a Mike Runnagall at Altitude, um, they often have really quite close relationships with those gap funders who, whose money is expensive. You know, it'll cost you up to 25%. Um, what they do is often take the risk and get paid out of the back end. So they come out before your soft equity does. So um, this is not meant to be a financing thing, but inevitably about the foreign markets, about how you fund your movie, and they are all sort of interlinked. Um, you, um, your um, gap um, money wants to see estimates, generally they will, they will give you about half of what your minimum estimate is. So they usually work to a two to one ratio. So if you, you're, you might have ho high, low and medium, most of the sales agents go and ask and a take. So there's an ask price and there's a take price, usually what they get is somewhere in between. And each, and each territory of the world is valued um, and they go up and down depending on the, the, um, the you know, the um, financial climate and the <coughs> particular market forces that drive them. So certain territories at the moment, you know, don't talk about Greece. Um, Italy's dodgy, Spain's not so good, Germany's remain consistently quite good and to very strong. Um, Netherlands is good, Scandinavia's been pretty consistent. Um, the UK is one of the tougher markets for theatrical at the moment. Um, and the US, most of them will give estimates of zero to a question mark because it's, you know, so often, you know, the films we make sell into Europe quite successfully, never sell into America. What consistently is happening more is entities like IFC, who are at all the key festivals, um, are buying through these labels like Sundance Direct. Um, they, they are picking up, you know, um, sometimes edgy, daring sort of stuff, certainly um, classy drama, and um, essentially playing those to just um, a few screens in New York, LA, getting critical a response to drive the video on demand, that's what VOD is, where it's actually quite lucrative um, for the filmmaker um, because you're actually getting a high net um, return, there are no costs effectively to deliver it, only an overhead to the provider. Um, uh, it's um, so really starting to drill down here now, yeah. it's a good opportunity to sort of just uh, stop there and, and put questions out to the audience, because here's a real opportunity. You've got somebody here who, who, who knows the, the international market really well, so it's a good time for questions. So, firstly. Yeah, um, with regard to animated genre pictures, um, are they necessarily expected to be at a budget that might not be so appropriate for a first time filmmaker? Because I can imagine not too much pride, or just the nature of genre pictures, and then add in the fact yeah. that it needs to be also. Yeah, um, it is. Um, it is very precise. I mean, most of the sales agent, uh, agents will say the sweet spot is about eight to eight and a half million US. Um, we, uh, over that, you know, it starts to get a struggle. This Julius Avery project I was pitching, it's called Son of a Gun, um, I could get um, through uh, a, quite a big local sale um, and um, the soft money, which included um, you know, cherry picking, doing post in New South Wales, a, a privilege we don't have in New Zealand, but um, Screen West, um, which is if you're going to do a co-production, my tip with Australia is head west. Go to Perth. You know, there is money there. Screen West will invest up to 800000 like um, over a million dollars in New Zealand, if you, you sort of tick enough of their boxes. Um, and um, 
so we've got quite a bit of money coming out of there. Uniquely, Julius Avery is a Western Australian lad. Um, so I could, um, but I also knew I couldn't get beyond 70% because I need 30% under the MEAA rules to bring in Ewan McGregor, who signed on board the project and did so a couple of weeks after camp. Um, the, um, the, so, you know, above that number, you know, the sales agents are getting into territory where it's kind of too risky for them. Um, so, in those numbers, it's pretty good. Um, unfortunately, the strength of the Australian dollar means, you know, eight and a half million US is really only about eight Australian. Uh, we, we look like we funded this Julius Avery thing at about ten and a half. Australia, and my pitch at at Sundance to the um, at, sorry at Can to the um, various sales agents was um, knowing the, to the English language sales agents who knew the the um, projects by their titles. I, my pitch rather <coughs> flippantly was it was much more the town than Snowtown. We were dealing with an action orientated thriller that wasn't going to be gritty. It's kind of got an edge to it. Um, uh, and this young filmmaker's got a unique personal story um, that thematically is, or is linked to the thematics, which will never really be <coughs> spoken about, but it's something that drives hit him. And he's kind of interested in particularly, uh, if, you know, he's a massive um, Michael Mann fan. Um, <coughs> He was there, so because he had his second film, he'd won the jury prize at Cannes three years ago, and that's when I signed on to do something with him. So we we um, pitched, you know, each other a few different ideas, um, and I latched on to something that I kind of had a feeling did have a connection to him, and then subsequently found out what it was, which I can't repeat, but it's more unique than hopefully you ever have to experience. Um, and uh, so we would, it was a long term plan, what it sort of links to this idea of being, um, be prepared, mm. don't go prematurely, do your research, know who you're going to be pitching to, do your research on who the new players are. I, I consciously looked at who were going to be the, the key people for a project like that. And I was also absolutely there for a bunch of New Zealand projects. The Tom Hearn one, um, a thing I've got in development with Tor Fraser that's um, much earlier. Um, the Lee Tamahori thing, we were <coughs> pitching to Wild Bunch, the French company who are very committed to it. Um, the, the, um, I was there, oh God, something else. It's gone. It's gone <laughs> at the time, but I had, you know, so I was there doing various meetings with different companies, with pitching certain projects, knowing that they had a particular appetite for a certain thing. Um, so the voltage is of this world, which, are, you know, action genre orientated, I'd be pitching the Julius Avery thing. Julius was there with another short film that he wrote and produced that was in competition too, which was very much genre, and they had two offers to make it into a feature based on just screening and at the festival. So there was a lot of heat. And what I should say is with um, the... Um, yeah, no, but this important point, Robin sort of touched on it, the, the role of the... Um, a agencies, you know, it becomes, in, if it's incredibly useful to you, you know, as much as you want to strive to keep your independence and, and not have these people sort of complicate your, your life, the truth is, it's pretty hard to get access to, you know, um, top flight talent in terms of actors without their involvement. UTA, um, one of the key packaging guys there is Rich Klubeck, um, who is a partner with Rena Ronson. Rich Klubeck um, happens to rep Julius Avery, um, and he reps the Cohen brothers and Wes Anderson. Um, he's one of the more powerful agent direct, uh, directors, sorry, agents of directors. He's used to packaging stuff up. The, the you know uh, studio can now fund a lot of the. Um, Cohen Brothers movie. So 
um, you, you, you know, it was a for irresistible force. You know, we were working together on that. It's kind of hard to control them because I was doing my thing, setting up my meetings, and they were doing their own thing. And um, you know, there were confusions at times. But um, very quickly, um, it was it, once word came out that we walked out of Cam, we had like ten sales agents bidding to rep that project, and. Um, that's got its own stress, you know, trying to make the right decision over the right company. Do you go for the biggest numbers or the, the, the most polite <laughs> or whatever your reason to, you know, favour someone over another? Um, the, uh, and that came down to who was going to work best with the chosen gap funder. Okay. Pete, hey, you had a question? Uh, Tim, I was just wondering, um, have you ever approach distributors early on a project, yeah, say, yeah, definitely. And, and constantly as the development's going, you, you're getting feedback from them on... Yeah, look, um, you, you do, they, they will track them, that's inevitably what, ha what, what happens. You, you, um, unless it gets to the point where they've got, say, you know, a Nikki Caro signs on, and... Um, not only Nikki Caro, Naomi Watts signs on, and um, you know, pick another great, you know, out of Australia, the the Hemsworth brothers both sign on. Um, <laughs> you know, you're seriously talking about being able to do a deal. Then um, most of the time, those searchlights, um, you know, because. I, I've got the privilege of, some of them are my friends, so I can call Claudia Lewis and go, look, will you read this thing? I love it. She'll read it and go, great, come back, um, you know, when you've got a cast. Um, and, and even when you've got a cast, they'll go, look, we'll buy it if we love it. You know, we'll keep tracking it. And sure as hell, prior to, you know, this Toronto screening, the Weinstein companies, uh, and p particularly them, because they're extremely aggressive, um, have been trying every back door to um, get to see Pip. You know, uh, so they're trying to get in ahead. But the sales agents will often very consciously go, "No, we'll make it an open market place. You know, we'll use that one screening to um, to try and you know turn up the heat because it's quite." quite hard to pick them off in that situation. But generally, with the distributors, it's really hard to get them to, to commit. You've got to have ingredients that make it irresistible to them. We've got time for another question or two. Christian? Um, when you try to take a project to the marketplace, how much emphasis is put on not the creative elements, but the budget and the financing plans? So for the first time you go, obviously, you're making a lot of assumptions. Um, you know, the budget, the budget yeah. you might end up where you actually end up shooting and posting and you, you're guessing a lot. Mm. So. Um, look, you are, and um, the truth is, you know, I was going in um, with that Julius Avery project, you know, knowing that I, to some extent, had to lowball it to get them interested, knowing that I'd actually be struggling to budget it at that number because the schedule was being done at the time and the initial budgets were coming out, and then subsequently they came out higher. Um, the, um, but that's all about sort of knowing your film when I say you've got to, um, and you've got to have a knowledge because they will go, you know, what can you bring? What do you want? from me? What are you asking for? And so you should know. And you go, I, I need, the budget is X, and I need 30%. So they, to, to some extent, the sales agent goes, OK, they're looking at that. And you hopefully don't have this happening too much. But to some extent, they know they've got to pitch their sales numbers. If they really want it, they've got to pitch their sales numbers <laughs> with a multiplier at a minimum take. Um, knowing that's going to cover your gap. So, um, yeah, they need that knowledge. They all, the, you're in a unique position, unlike most um, American independent producers, where, you know, you can get at a low budget level, you know, a high level of soft money. You know, you can get 80% of it covered. Uh, Clearly, the NZFC is putting you more under more and more pressure to get higher levels of 
foreign investment or private. I think we've got one more question and then that'll uh, have to do it. Hi, hi Tim. Um, hi. I think uh, in New Zealand we've got a, a, a really interesting growth area in animation and the capabilities of producing quality animated mm. output. Is there a growing appetite internationally do you think you can consume that? Or is there a tough growth really happy? Um, it, it's a really specialist thing. You know, interestingly, um, this one here, who I'm helping with an animated project, but you know, I know I need to haul in people who are way more expert. Um, it's not a realm of knowledge uh, for me. Um, there's absolutely an appetite out there. Um, I think you have to find some smart um, partners really. Um, the animation, you know better than I, is also not cheap, you know, generally to do it well. I had a friend who, um, a really good friend of mine, who did um, Shane Acker's Nine, which was one of the few sort of independently funded things. Focus got themselves involved. Tim Burton, he brought Tim Burton in as a partner to try and get it, um, you know, financed. So you seriously have to start thinking that high. I think we've got time for one more question, if anybody has one. Yes? Well, um, what's, like, the films that move in like, waves, so, like paranormal activity, things explode and yeah. don't stop. What's like, the next wave and what waves are crashing? Um, <laughs> I wouldn't tell you if I knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's it? Yeah, look, I mean, the great thing is the rule book just gets constantly rewritten, you know. Um, and um, certainly, you know, I didn't touch on it, you know, generally um, the schlocker horror thing is not my thing, you know. I'm, I get a bit weak kneed at the side of too much, you know, um, um, unmotivated blood. But um, I, yeah, I, um, you know, that's definitely something that. Uh, you can, you know, make here just as easily as you can make in Ohio or, you know, Norway. I think uh, we'll have to call it a day here. So uh, Tim's given us a heck of a lot of information. And as we said, um, a lot, uh, the names and the companies that, that are relevant at the moment will be available possibly at, um, sometime in the next few days, maybe up to a week out via script to screen. So please contact them if you'd like to get hold of that. Otherwise, I'd just like you to say a big thanks to Tim and also to...